This is the Milo Beasley Show. This is the Milo Beasley Show. There's only one thing you need to know. This is the Milo Beasley Show. And now, here's your host, Milo Beasley. And welcome to the Milo Beasley Show. Doot, 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 doot. Episode, wait, actually, I got something. I got something a little bit. Here we go. Episode number 350 of the Milo Beasley Show. And uh, I'm I'm so happy. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, I, I, just let me let me go ahead and, and, and do our introduction. Uh, you may have seen her on, on television shows everywhere. You've seen her. You've seen her voice. You've heard her voice on shows literally everywhere, especially if you have the Disney Plus. Uh, please help me welcome at this time. Mary of Harrington, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Milo? I'm I'm super excited to, to, to have you on. So um, thanks for funny having story. me. Uh, uh, I was in I was doing the L.A. thing a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And I was doing the Disneyland thing. Nice. Um, with my uh, almost two two year old. <laughs> we were going hot and heavy from park open to park close every day. And on the last day, bless his little heart, he was under the weather oh so we ended up staying in the hotel room uh for the majority of that last day um and we just watched uh, uh disney channel mm-hmm. and big city greens was on <laughs> I and was i wasn't i mean i had heard the name <laughs> i had heard the name but i wasn't familiar and i fell in love what a great show i mean i'm 40 years old and i love it I know. Listen, that was the the whole thing. When I even from just the audition sides, I was like, "This is a really good show." <laughs> like it, well, you could just tell it was funny. And what's interesting is, I've been saying for years because now, like, I've been working on the show for six. Well, actually, I did the pilot seven years ago, which is insane to think about the passage of time. But um, you know it's only kind of now that I feel like a lot of my friends are watching and they're like, this is a really good show. I'm like, that's what I've been saying for all these years is it's not just, you know, a job, an opportunity to be creative. No, no, no. Like it's entertaining, not just for the kids, but for the adults, which I feel like is rare. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I, gosh, I love, I love Tilly. She's just uh, amazing. <laughs> um, the voice for Tilly, it's it's not like uh, a lot of the other voices that you've done. Uh, there's like a little, you know, I, I, I guess a lisp in there, something. Where um, did you develop that? You know, I I wish I could say that, I, oh, I had crafted each piece of it so carefully. Um, it was something that was much more sort of like organic and uh, spontaneous and from instinct, I suppose you would say. I, they provided her um, drawing the picture of Tilly, which you get sometimes, most of the time with animation, but not all the time. And it just helps tremendously. And she just had these big eyes and there was an inherent, I could just tell that there was, she was gonna be a little bit sort of flatter and not just like so typical cartoon character in a way. Um, so yeah, I just locked eyes with the drawing and this voice came out of me that I had never really heard before. Uh, but that was it. And, it, and, and I am someone who overthinks the heck out of everything. <laughs> and I think I went into the booth and I laid down two takes, maybe that's it. No overthinking. I was like, I think that's it. And I just sent it in. And then let it go, and here you are. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, th- that's amazing. Did you? So you didn't audition like in a studio in person then? No. So um, voiceover has even pre-pandemic was very much audition from home. Okay. Uh, they would have callbacks in person, and we did for this. But um, no, first rounds of auditions. Gosh, I mean, really, since I've moved to the U.S., so like thirteen years. Um, has been it's all been recorded from home um yeah or i suppose 13 years ago you like went in and some agencies still do this where you'll record at the agency but by and large 
you have to have your own setup. So I auditioned for Tilly. I had built, um, I lived in a loft at the time that was very echoey. So under the stairs, I'm five foot two, you can't tell over this platform. I built a little home studio. It was like my little Harry Potter closet, people would refer to it as. And so I hopped into my Harry Potter closet, laid down two takes, emailed it off, and yeah, the rest is history. That's that's so awesome. I, I have to I have to ask, how much fun are the random rings to do? Those are not only fun, but just like deeply gratifying <laughs> because there's something just so fun and creative. One the way that animation is done nowadays, you generally record one at a time. It's not like when I started my first series regular that I had um, was on a show called Delilah and Julius back in Toronto uh, in Canada. And we would have like seven, eight people crammed into this recording studio at once and you're playing off of one another. Reason I bring up how animation used to be done is because yeah, now we're doing it one by one. And while that works and is very scheduling friendly, um, it doesn't often, it sometimes you lose some of the magic of playing off one another. So the random rings is very special because, you know, stuff comes up that you didn't expect, right? Like that you're, uh, that, you know, Chris is so funny as, as Cricket. He's just a funny person just in general and a dear friend now and uh some of the stuff that he would just throw out there i mean and that we get to volley back and forth between us is just it's it's so much fun and some of these things that would fly out of our mouths we're like where did that come from it's just like improv class uh plus animation like it just it just feels good yeah they're i mean they're if, if honestly if, if you're if you're watching this um and you haven't watched <laughs> uh, big city green or you haven't watched the, the random rig seg segments on that and they just play randomly too on on disney channel oh do they yeah they just play they just play them like in between like r other shows they'll just play them and uh i mean they're, they're so funny i mean so it takes fun. takes you know prank calls to a, a whole new level yeah yeah now dear are you aware of how they made them like because they're they are improvised yes yeah. Did you know that? Okay, cool. Um, Cause yeah, some things can sometimes feel improvised, but they're right. not necessarily, this was just the way they made them was like structured improv where they said, okay, this is like generally the setup, but then right. just like go. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so good. And then you've actually even written episodes as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, yeah did, but... how did that come about that you're, did, did they bring it up to you or did you go, Hey, so can I have a shot at this? Yeah. So um, my husband and I are a writing team together. And, um, you know, it sort of organically came up. I I was, um, the showrunners knew that my husband and I wrote together. And then one day I, I had gone in to record and I'd had a dream about like a Tilly storyline. And as I was leaving the studio, I was like, oh, I had this crazy idea for something. And um just was an organic like well we we might have like you know um some space on the episode schedule for for some freelance writers if that might be of interest you know there's a whole big protocol of like you'd have to come in and pitch you know episodes and everything and and so we said yeah we'd love to it took a lot of preparation because we pitched about like eight different ideas um to them went in for our, a half day of story consulting uh to to pitch that um and then they said oh we're gravitating towards this particular idea um and uh we developed it from there went back in fixed some things got some notes um and what's interesting is when you write an episode you write it in conjunction with the storyboard artists on this particular show not every show is the pipeline is slightly different but um yeah we we craft the story basically and and like certain jokes we'll put in like paragraph form but in terms of creating a script the script is actually developed last this, the writers give an outline, the storyboard artists create the storyboards that then turn into the animatic, and from the animatic, then like a, a final draft document with the script is generated from there. That's, yeah. I, that's I mean, it's it's funny to hear how different shows are, are done, 
Uh, I speak to a lot of people on animation side. I speak to a lot of people on the anime side, which is completely oh. different from totally. you know animation. So uh, it's uh, it's it's really interesting to hear the different ways that that things are are, are made. Well, and for me personally, this was my first time working on what's called a board driven show, you know, um, when I've done other shows, they were script driven shows. So like the script was gospel. We really went off of that. There was no visual uh, to go right. off of the big city greens is very much like, you know, that's, that's your anchor point is, are the boards. Right. Uh, yeah. uh you've been nominated twice for an Emmy. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it really nice to be nominated or do you really want to win? It's so nice to be nominated. <laughs> I was truly shocked. Um, I don't think the first time I even knew my hat was in the ring for it, like that they had put me up for it. So it was so shocking. Um, it's extremely nice. I mean, sure. Now I, I would love to win because I've had the taste of like the nominations you know, but um, yeah, it's absolutely really nice because you think about, man, especially nowadays, how much um, content there is that's made. So right. to, you know, from an actor's perspective, like it feels like a miracle to ever be employed. <laughs> this word just always auditioning and hoping to get a job um, and keep a job and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so like to have a job on a show you like, um, with people you like, um, and then they put your work forward and out of the hundreds of shows and hundreds of characters on those shows that you should be one of five or six recognized in a year. I mean, that's pretty cool when you put it in perspective. So no, I'm thrilled is exactly where I am. I, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, now with big city greens and, and you mentioned earlier about, filming in studio, mm -hmm. but for some of those seasons, I, you had to, you were recorded at home, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of season three. Oh, so man, um, are you back in the studio now for it? Yeah. So right okay, now cool. it's, a, it's, a, it's a mix of both um, where you can now most people, um, well, I shouldn't say most, I think it's about 50, 50 have like, great home setups and um those who've said you know this is not for me or don't have the space right. for it or what have you um so we're given we're very we're very lucky in that we're given the option to go in or to work from home so i have a great studio from home but sometimes it's also just nice to get out of the house sort of refresh your brain before going into you know the creative process having a bit more of a buffer from like family life into creative life Right. Do you, so do you have a, I guess like you, I, I, I was going to say, do you have a preference, but you kind of just answered that, uh, with, you know, you know, sometimes it's nice to get out, but yeah, for, for, for a studio. Now I have to ask, did you record anything like in your PJs? Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I have historically been the person who, you know, the, the joke about like doing voiceover is, actors will say oh it's the best kind of acting because you can wear your pjs and i just i have not subscribed to that to be honest like one um i've always just kind of felt like the rules were different for women like and like show up and be professional when you would go into a studio um but uh certainly i mean i kept recording like right after i had my daughter in the fall and that was like chaos, those first couple recording sessions of being like feeding the baby, handing her off and all this stuff. And um, I, I did. I had my pajama pants on and I was like, well, this is as new mom as you get, you know, in pajamas with no makeup on. Um, but that's sort of the, the one time where I've allowed myself to do that. Because, again, it also comes down to um, me being in the headspace and that professional creative headspace. Right. How, how has the balance been with being a, a, a new mother and workload and not only like a new mother, um, but a new mother during this pandemic? Yeah. Well, listen, you're, you're in the trenches of parenting too during a pandemic. If your son is two, he was born yep. like. Yep. He was born in, in, in August. Like, so he's about to be two. So he was born in August. So right in the middle of 2020, 
And, you know, my yeah. wife loved it because she never had to go outside so people could see her pregnant. She liked not being seen in that way. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And I kind of mourned not being able to do that kind of stuff. Like even my baby shower was like very small and intimate and had to be outdoors and a little, um, you know, wondering, is this like safe to do? Um, no, I mean, look, there's, um, a friend of mine says there's no um, work-life balance. There's only balancing, like the constant act of like, and things are often going to be out of balance. Um, so I'm just doing my best. I don't know. Some days I feel like I'm doing a better job than others. <laughs> um, but at least, look, I'm just super grateful to be on a show that feels um, very joyous and, um, and, and, and just continues to sort of fill my heart because I don't think I could go from sort of the challenges of parenting. And then of course, parenting in the pandemic in a crazy world and work on something that was like very heavy. I think that would be, that would be a tough load to carry. So um, yeah, balancing it one day at a time, Milo, one day at a time. I, I hear you 100, 1000% one day at a time. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and but you're no stranger, like I said during the intro, to the the Disney family. I mean, you've done so many shows with them: uh, Doc McStuffins, mm -hmm. Vampirina, Mickey and the Roads to Racers, and uh, you were on. You just you were so a good friend of mine, one of my best friends, is Dana Snyder, who voices Scratch and uh -huh. Molly, Molly McGee. McGee. And so you were just you just did an appearance there as well. How did mm -hmm. how did that come about? Because that that show is taking off as well. Yeah, that was a um, that was an audition. They requested um, casting. Said you know like we're thinking of you for this. Um, could you audition for it? And um, it's funny. It was not an accent that I thought. You know, just like one that's in my super comfortable arsenal. Right. But. Um, because I was doing a Boston accent and um, and kind of a parody of a, I was supposed to be over the top. So sorry, Bostonians. I'm not saying that's like actually how you sound. Um, but yeah, so I just, I auditioned for it and then, and there you go. But no, the Disney, Disney channel has been my home. I mean, for as long as I've been in LA, I mean, even good luck, Charlie, um, yep. Yep. A dog with a blog, which is, I guess, sort of like a, an interesting in between space between the animated and the live action, where I right. was the voice of the puppy. So, yeah, it's I I love all the Disney programming. What can I say? Again, it feels joyous. Uh, what was your first? What was your first Disney show that you were on? I'm trying to figure out if. Doc McStuffins was before or after Good Luck Charlie. It's hard to say. Or Sophia the First. Ooh, no, Sophia the First came after that. I don't know. I'd have to check. I'd have to check IMDb because it's it's sort of all um, melt together. Of course, the thing that um, you know your viewers may or may not know is how long animation takes so just because it comes right. out on my imdb after right um you know uh, a certain credit it may have been recorded a year and a half it, it takes big city greens a year and a half to animate oh wow because mm -hmm. it's all hand drawn oh it's still ha oh wow Mm -hmm. oh, in a world of computer animation that's uh that's i did i actually i did not even know that so that's yeah even, and even better to me it's super cool and it, and i think it contributes to the um you know like we're we're country family there's this kind of like home yep. home down home feel about the show and i think even you know the way in which the animation is drawn by hand in korea um i think it all it all adds up you know to that overall feeling do you being an LA person? Do you get a chance to go to the the parks out there? Are you gonna you're gonna be able to to bring your daughter to the parks? I hope so. I hope when this current COVID surge, um, you know, and also when she's old enough to appreciate it, right? Um, yeah, and you know, it's like it's has really sucked with the pandemic because we were starting to do some really cool fan stuff. We did D twenty three and Disney Fan Fest out there, which was 
really fun. Um, so I'm hoping that that sort of starts to come back um, as COVID recedes, hopefully, eventually. <sighs> I'll be at I'll be at D23 uh just uh I think it's just like a two months away now, less than less oh than gosh, two months wild. away. Wild. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know. Um so, so uh okay. and, so will you uh you think you'll uh make an appearance out there this year? I don't know. I haven't heard any whisperings, but just because I haven't doesn't mean that it's not Right. In the hopper, the there's so much going on with the show right now. Uh, the movie um, you may have seen was announced. There's a movie musical on the pipeline. We've started working on season four. I'm actually directing season four. Um, in addition to doing Tilly and the Random Voices, and then we have all this like multi-platform stuff. You mentioned Random Rings, these theme song takeovers. There's just a lot happening. So like I say, just because... They haven't uh, said anything yet. Doesn't mean it won't happen. How do you find time to do everything? Because, like you said, you and you and your husband are are, are busy. You know, you guys have your TikTok, Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just and you're working full time, and you're being a parent full time. How do you find time for yourself? Um, there's less of it right now. Um, I'm not great at it. I think. I think the thing is, luckily. I love my creative work so much that that feels like it's time for me, you know, right. like that's, that's the best, right. When you can, um, you just, there's something very personal. You can sort of imprint whatever you're working through and to your creative stuff, which I know sounds weird to say, um, when you work even like in kids television. Um, but there's always a way to kind of bring yourself to the work. So that's kind of the, ideal and kind of the only way that I've been able to do it right now because there's not much time with a with a very very active mobile nine month old uh, uh, yeah I, I get it I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, large and in charge mm -hmm. uh, I've watched uh, quite a few clips and it's fantastic um, did that just come about like hey we're doing these things it's funny let's record them or uh, how is how did that come about that to come up with that channel? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, my husband and I write together, and um, we were doing that typical thing, right? That creatives do of like, okay, well, I guess we should have a social media presence, but like, what would it be? And we kind of circled a couple ideas for, you know, I would say a year, a year and a half, and nothing really stuck. We we did an Instagram series called Instagrammy, which was. Instagrammy. Um, yeah, I played myself and my 80, oh, what? I mean, she's 100 now, um, but it was kind of her like 80s-ish version um, of my grandmother. Uh, or she's my grandmother in the show, but she's my great aunt in real life. Uh, so we did that Instagram series and we were like, well, what should we do next on social media to sort of help build us up as like a creative team and kind of get us out there? And we couldn't figure it out. And it was only when um, the pregnancy came about that we felt like there was a lot of weird stuff we could poke fun at. And, and it was just a way for us to sort of process the events happening around in our own lives. So we thought, oh, let's just like put it out there and see what happens with like not huge expectations of it. And then it really took off on TikTok um, with like millions of views on some of them. And, uh, and it felt, this is something you will never hear in talking about social media, but it felt very um, fulfilling and a way of like truly connecting with people. You know, there would be comments from moms like around the world being like, oh my God, my daughter did this. Or, oh my gosh, I'm excited for this phase of parenthood. Um, Cause they're all like, you know, uh, pregnancy sketches or like new parent sketches, right? And uh, people would be like, oh yeah, this happened with my second daughter my third is due in September and people would comment like good luck I'll be thinking of you and it became this like beautiful thing so yeah it it, it just it took on a life of its own and we felt like it was a wonderful way to process our new parenthood experiences and find some camaraderie um in this in this phase of our lives you know that could be especially feel isolating during the pandemic too oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Now you mentioned Instagrammy. 
Uh, great little series. Who did the editing for that? Because you're on screen with you, like next to you. Like what? So how, who did the editing for that? Was it? Did you do that in house? Uh, my husband. He's amazing. You know. I would he, say. I would say it's so good. It's yeah, so good. He, so professional, man. He's a writer, sort of. I think, like at his core, he's a writer, but he's he's actually a storyteller. He's really gotten very into directing you know directed instagram he directs all of our our tiktoks and there's nothing that man can't teach himself on youtube let me tell you so he just he just figured it out and you know we shot that whole um all of season two which really was like a short film it was like 12 and a half minutes uh you know 12 episodes or 15 minutes 12 episodes and uh we shot all of it in two days, we were the only cast and crew. He edited the whole thing. And um, yeah, that was just a lot of um, his vision because he, the way he directs, he knows how he's going to edit it as he's directing. So he, he can have a real economy of shots that way. And, um, and yeah, it was just a lot of me acting to post-it notes. <laughs> I, I didn't have any castmates, right? It was right. just me. <laughs> so... Yeah. Now we, we've talked about, you know, your long IMDb list of, of uh, Disney show credits and cartoon credits, but you've done some, uh, I guess, uh, live action television mm -hmm. shows as well. Modern Family, Graceland, uh, How mm -hmm. I Met Your Mother. Do mm -hmm. you have a, a preference, whether it's live action or voice acting? I think they, they both offer... Uh, they, they kind of scratch a different part of that creative uh, proverbial itch, shall we say. But I will say the thing that's really fun on camera and specifically with multicam is the immediacy of the laughter. Like I love anytime I can do a multicam in front of a live audience, that's magic because you automatically know if what you're doing is resonating, you know, um, it, it's so wonderful to hear people say like, oh my gosh, I, I so identify with Tilly or any other um, animated character, but it's like, I never get to see that reaction. And it happens, that reaction is occurring a year and a half from the time of my performance. There's something super cool about being in that moment together with the audience. And sometimes what's interesting about it too is a joke won't land. It won't work. You're going to hear it immediately and the writers are going to go to work to get, do something like change, change the line to get something funny. So there's, there's a real collaboration between the audience um, and the actors, the writing staff, all the director. Um, that's kind of fascinating. So are you, are you big in the theater as well? Since that is also immediate uh, either gratification or, or immediate, regret. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have done very limited theater out here in LA. I did back in Toronto, but it wasn't really my path here. Um, more kind of in the improv uh, space. I used to be involved at UCB and pre pandemic was getting very involved with groundlings and I'm super excited to be back there now, but that's been my, that's been my main sort of live performance. And for, for that reason, exactly. It feeds your soul instantly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've talked to a, a, a lot of uh, actors on this, on the show and they all tend to gravitate towards that, you know, live theater because the feedback is instantaneous. And like you said, for a television show or a, a, a movie, you don't necessarily know unless you are watching with other people mm -hmm. if that stuff hits. Yeah. Yeah. So those any anytime I can get on a show where there's a live audience, that's like. And also there's just a, there's an energy, everybody who's who's in the audience, who's there to watch. It's like, how could you not right. feel that? You know, you have to you have to do a, some generating of that for yourself when it comes to animation. You know, you've got to like. Caffeinate your own performance to a certain degree, <laughs> you know, uh, we've talked about um acting and uh on both big city greens and and other stuff stuff with your uh your husband writing directing but we haven't even touched again you're so 
uh, busy and talented. We haven't even touched upon your band. Oh, well, the band at the moment, I'm not performing live at the moment. Okay. You know, there only are so many hours in the day. Well, but, this is what I'm uh, saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So right now my singing is taking place. You know, there's a lot of music in this new season of Big City Green. So that's where most of my musical work is being done at the moment. Uh, how did... How did the the jazz band come? Is that your preferred style of of music, of your music listening, of your music, uh, of your singing? Is that your preferred uh, style genre, or is it just something that happened and you happened into it and it was good? It's a great question because. Um... I started singing when I was very young, doing sort of like local festivals when I was like 12 years old. And, you know, it was at a time I was singing like pop music at the time. And it was kind of when like Britney Spears kind of was like on the scene. And that's what pop music was becoming, was needing to be sort of dressed slightly scandalous. And it was just... Um, it just didn't feel right. And my dad was extremely into jazz at the time. And my agent um, for acting back in Toronto, who she's still my agent, by the way, uh, like 20 years later, um, <laughs> she had given me a CD of Blossom Deary. And she was like, oh, she's got a, a, a voice very similar to yours. I thought that you would like her. Then my dad was very into Jazz FM, which was this Canadian um, jazz station. And it just sort of was this organic thing where I think like the forces around me were like jazz, jazz, jazz. And then I fell into it. And I've always had a bit of an old soul. I, I like old homes and I like, you know, antiques. It just, I, I don't know. Um, so it just, it just fit. Um, and so I put together a band of that material and started performing that. I had put my band together when I was 15. Not the same guys, obviously in LA, but um, yeah, it's been been a, a a long time where I think I just felt cozy there. I get it. But I have zero musical ability whatsoever. I uh, can't play any instruments. I can't sing. I can't do anything. So uh, I don't know. I bet you're just like you. a creative guy. I bet you can sing. Not, not you. You don't want to. Uh, so I, I had a, I had a musical guest on uh, last week, uh, Derek uh, Sharinian. Um, and he does jazz as well. And I, and I asked him if he got a chance to go see Jeff Goldblum, uh, at his, uh, at his club. And he was very offended at the question, uh, implying that wasn't real jazz, but have you gotten a chance to go see Jeff Goldblum or is that a, a, a dream duet to, to do with Jeff Goldblum? Oh my God. I mean, sure. I they never say never, you know, I'm, I'm not, I was, I haven't can, can't say that I'm like seeking it out at the moment. Um, Cause you know, I just don't go out very much these days um, <laughs> well, with baby yeah. and pandemic and managing all that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's like, what is real jazz? You know, I'm, I never was one of these singers who like scatted. So it's like, am I less of a singer because I didn't, scat i don't know everybody has their own opinions i guess right uh music is a perfect segue uh to go into one of the things that we do here called the milo beasley show frequently asked questions i'm gonna ask you the same five questions that i ask to every single guest on the show there's no wrong answers it's uh you know so okay. are we ready ready all right so question number one what was the first concert you ever attended? Symphony when I was seven years old with my parents at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto. Perfect. See, I think that I think that speaks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two. Do you believe in ghosts? Yeah. Have I do. you had anything weird happen to you? Uh yeah, a couple Christmases ago, we were in my mom's apartment, um, and I thought that my mom had, we were staying in her room, and I thought I saw her walk to the bathroom. She claimed she was never up all night, uh, that she had walked through the bedroom we were staying in into her bathroom. So, yeah, 
I do. It's creepy. I don't mm-hmm. know if I do or not. I, I'm on the fence. Um, I feel like there there could be something there, but. Yeah, I don't know that I believe it in the traditional like woo kind of like way, right. but I think there's definitely um, like, I'm not religious, but sort of like um, more spiritual and like an energy. I mean, it's LA, okay? I've been here for enough time and I've turned into that woo woo person <laughs> that I think like, ah, the energy just doesn't like disappear. It's got to go somewhere. Right. Yeah. I, so um, I will not watch like reality based move like um or exorcist based especially mm. exorcist based movies i will not watch anything like that that could be real i know oh, really? yeah i won't watch any anything like that like weird doll movies no thank you <laughs> no thank you no thank you no all right question number three is a little twist on a commonly asked question in a movie about your life who would play your parents <sighs> Oh, that is tough. I'm also really bad with actor names. Um, and I don't know that many like petite French Canadian actresses. <sighs> um, I mean, I guess my mother sounds like Celine Dion. She's got like that typical uh, French Canadian accent. So uh, she's the only person, I don't know, pass. This is really hard. <laughs> That's really hard. I'm seeing the guy who would play my um, my dad and his name is escaping me. I'll come back. I'll All right. come back to it. We'll circle back. We'll circle back. Uh, yeah. All right. Question number four. Who is your favorite person to follow on social media? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I have to fire up my phone. My, my um, head is blanking right now um she doesn't put a ton out there but i it just makes me happy when melissa mccarthy posts things because she always seems like she's having just the best time with her husband it just feels like they're perpetually like happy and laughing i'm sure there's other people because she doesn't put that much out there but that's all i can think of right now all right and then question number five uh whether it's been um, on a, uh, in a studio, whether it's been at a, like a, a comic convention, whether it's been on the streets of LA, what has been your biggest fanboy moment where you saw somebody and freaked out? Either you had to go talk to them or you couldn't talk to them. Like you couldn't get the words out. Oh, I couldn't get the words out fangirling um it's i'm sure there are other ones that are more recent but when i was in high school i was shooting this evil knievel movie of the week and um the one of the leads of csi i was huge i watched csi when i was in high school you know it's like it was cool back then it was wasn't on season like 425 the way they are now and george eads i thought was like very good looking and i show up to set for this evil knievel um movie i was playing a candy striper who like helped mr knievel out of the hospital and then like fangirls and kisses him um george eads was evil knievel and my job that day was to kiss him so and i was like i was a really big fan of of csi at the time so the director's telling me to like, you know, get in there, kiss them and like kiss them for a long time. But I was so nervous that I was doing it like really fast because I just felt awkward. Um, so I ended up kissing him like twice as many times as I probably should have, which maybe my subconscious was like, you just want to kiss him. So that's <laughs> a real awkward, like didn't even want to talk to him, let alone have to like kiss him. Um, but I did it. You may be one of the first people who I've ever talked to that ended up kissing their fanboy moment. Yeah, I'm sure there have been other ones like on the street randomly, but um, that was certainly one that popped out in my head. And fun fact, my agent called me after that job and was like, Mary, I have bad news. And I was like, oh, no, my scene ended up on the cutting room floor. She said, no, 
Not that they overdubbed your voice because they felt like it was too high. So in, if you if anybody like goes looking for it, you'll see my face. You will not hear my voice because they overdubbed with somebody else's voice, which is of course hilarious given you're what I often do. So <laughs> there you go. Oh my God, that's 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 perfect. Uh, now we talked about it, uh, before we came on, uh, and your, your background, it's, uh, it's amazing. Oh, uh, thank you. That's the, uh, could you see yourself moving back to Canada after living this LA lifestyle? Oh, you know, when it gets crazy hot. Yeah. And you know, in LA it gets the, the heat is starting to be just really bananas. Um, but look, my creative community is here. My friends are here and, um, and while they're, the industry, you know, lives in Toronto as well, there's just a lot more comedy here, um, which whether it's live action or animated or writing stuff or sketch, like there's just more, it just feels like there's a bigger hub of comedy here than in Toronto. So I, it, I think it would be tough to move back. I understand that. Uh, before we wrap, uh, for folks that want to find you on the social medias, I know you have, you know, your own plus mm -hmm. your projects, but where can folks find you if they want to, to follow you and, 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 you know, see what you have coming up? Yeah. So just at red Harrington and that's H um, red R E U. There you go. You have it on screen. I don't even need to spell it out. H E R I N G T O N. Yep. Where just I, one R, just one R everybody. Right, that's right. Just one R. And uh, where I, there, like the link to Large and In Charge TV, um, which is our weekly sketches, um, and then info about our uh, upcoming short film, which is coming out soon. Uh, I'll be posting there as well. So that that's like the hub, though, at Red Harrington, and then I spider out to these various projects. So, uh, what else? Uh, what can you tell us? Uh, again, you you mentioned the movie, but you know, are there any other projects that you have coming out that you're allowed to talk about? Uh, I would just say, I, what am I allowed to talk about? Yes. Um, <laughs> That's our, always the big question, right? No, right? Especially with like with such long lead times on some of the, on some of this stuff. Um, all I can say right now, I think safely for sure, for sure, is yeah, Big City Greens movie coming. We've got a great big um, 30 episode, 30 half hour episode um, season coming up for season four. And then the short film that... Uh, that my husband and I made um, will be coming out hopefully in the fall that um, some film festivals will be um, screening it and then we'll make it available online after that. So um, it's a project that's very near and dear to our hearts. So hopefully um, your viewers can check it out. That's awesome. Again, I, I mentioned, you know, I stumbled upon uh, big city greens and now I love it. Is there a show that, you know, on let's say a kid show on Disney plus or so, that you stumbled upon that you love on Disney channel. Yeah. Um, Sydney to the max. I, okay. I think is like a really well done to me. It feels almost like, you know, a good luck, Charlie 2.0 um, type situation where I'm like waving to my baby in the window. Sorry. <laughs> She's in the house. <laughs> like, I'm not just going to let that, let that go. Like, Oh yeah. Um, and I, uh, yeah, it's just it's just like as one of these great shows where um, it's just like a good sitcom where the leads happen to be kids, you know. Fantastic. It doesn't feel like like they're talking down to kids if that makes sense. Right, I've seen it, I've seen commercials, but I haven't watched it. So now I will, on your recommendation, go check that out. It's uh, very thank, sweet. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I, I don't know. Super big episode three hundred and fifty. I can't believe. Congratulations! What a feat. Thank you. It's uh, never, never thought I would be here. Started off as a joke, and here I am, eight years later. Uh, thank you all for for watching. If you haven't already, of course, you know, hit that subscribe button. Uh, but most importantly, tell your friends. And this weekend, I will be hanging out at GalaxyCon Raleigh, doing our Q and As uh, with our celebrities. In fact, in fact, uh, Maria, we'll be doing a Seven Deadly Sins Q and A. Oh. With Mac Aguilar and Christina V. Oh, yes. So yeah, that was another project you were on. Uh, we need to get you to come hang out. Oh, my the gosh. Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's a, a lot of them. They all sort of start to blend together at some point, but it's all good. 
So thank you for hanging out with me and thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see you next week.